This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Um. Okay, we're live. I'm Jay Fidel. It's uh, we do the Squeeze Show at three thirty. <laughs> here on I'm Think Tech, today. we have a special visitor, <laughs> a special guest, and we, we we kind of roped him into the show. This is a retired judge, chief judge of the Second Circuit of Hawaii, uh, Shackley Raffetto. Welcome back to the show. It's great to have you, Shackley. Thank you, Jay. Glad to be back. So you are an expert in Mongolia, and that's why we're calling this show the new uh, due process in Mongolia. What can we learn from each other? So much to discuss. So my first question for you, and you've been there several times. It's one of your favorite places, yeah? Why? <laughs> oh, uh, I, I first started going there with military. They actually asked for a, a, a program of uh, U.S. military officers, all JAG officers, from uh, the Defense Institute of International Legal Studies in Newport, Rhode Island, to come out and put on a... That's where uh, the Naval Justice School that's is. That's right, yeah. exactly. Uh, and that's where this is headquartered as well. Um, and put on a training program for their judges. And it was attended by all, all their uh, Supreme Court justices as well as mm -hmm. other judges. Uh, from other courts, and I got to know two people there very well. One is Justice Ganzorig, who was uh, Associate Justice, and another was Justice Jansen, who has since passed away. Mm -hmm. And I, this was years ago now, and uh, we stayed friends over the years, and, and I went back several times with the military. One of the things that interesting that they, that they do is they send uh, troops out for peace, peacekeeping missions. Uh, for the UN, apparently there's a lot of money in that for these small countries, and it and well, because it, they get paid for doing the peacekeeping. Yeah, thing. and sometimes they share the money with soldiers, and sometimes the <laughs> sometimes they don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but there's money in it, and so. Uh, but b before we let them loose on behalf of the um, of the UN with their blue helmets, we want to make sure that they have some training in human rights and military justice and things like that, and. If there is a uh, status of forces agreement, you know, which covers what happens if a soldier gets in trouble for one reason or another, I want to make sure they understand about those things. So yeah. I was returning doing those things, and then um, I just started going for fun because uh, Judge and I became good friends. And uh, it was social. Yeah, and uh, and I. I, we did a program a year, a year or so ago when his yeah. daughter got married. His yeah. daughter worked in my chambers for a, for a, so uh, cool. a summer and stayed with me and wanted to become a lawyer very bad like her dad. And she did. She went back to New York, became a lawyer, and got married. And I uh, attended her wedding in Mongolia. And what, uh, what's happened now is... Uh, it, we had it, footage of that. We had photographs of that. On that's the right. I remember. Well, the whole family, for a number of years, lived in uh, Washington, D.C., where the uh, justice was working on a Ph.D. in constitutional law. So she grew up, basically, in America, and, and so did her brother. And uh, so it was hard for her to go back. And uh, when, when the time came, and she figured a way to continue her education, and then she ended up marrying a guy from New York. Perfect and story. Now, now she's now she's working for one of our uh, lady um, um, associate uh, judges of our intermediate court of appeals, and plans to stay in Hawaii. Wow, oh, interesting. Make it her home, and so. The truth is, though, you know, I never met aside from the people that you brought one time to our studio, mm -hmm. and we met them, judges and whatnot, yes. uh, a couple of years ago. Now, I never really met Mongolian people. Uh -huh. I just. I haven't run into them. But there are not a lot of them around. Yeah? There's, there are more and more. Uh, there um, is the largest population outside of Mongolia is in Washington, D.C. Um, and the, the, uh, there, there's, a, I guess, a sizable group in San Francisco. In fact, I was having a hamburger in, on Broadway <laughs> one day, and, and, the, and I asked this woman, because she looked Asian, and I, and I asked her where she was from, and she says, oh, I'm from Mongolia. And I said, well, wow. sign by no. <laughs> she says, hi. You know, and she, she just about yeah, I'm sure dropped she her jaw, down. dropped, yeah. 
Well, that, no, that's fabulous. I mean, I go through the same thing. I go to the mainland. I'm always looking for Asian faces. Uh, yeah. I always want to find out what's going on, why, what the story is. It's great. Who are you? Where are you from? And we, and we, ha we can do that because we're from Hawaii. We have special license to do that because we're from Hawaii, right? I don't feel uncomfortable doing it now. Me too. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, with, uh, when uh, Justice Gensorg returned to Mongolia, he, he first he was the uh, lawyer for the president of Mongolia, and then he moved from there to, uh, today he is the deputy assistant um, prosecuting attorney for Mongolia. They have a statewide prosecutor's office, and so he's uh, one of the top management there. And they're putting on a uh, an international law conference. I'm not sure how many people from other places there will be except me, but he invited me to come. They've adopted uh, a proceeding called a preliminary hearing, which we have here. Um, it's like it's, criminal matters. Right, right. It's a way to provide due process, and it's a way to interface um, a third party between the power of the state and the individual who's being charged with a crime. The, and, pros the prosecutor. I mean, you keep the keep the prosecutor under control that way. That's yeah. right. And the traditional way was uh, the grand jury. That's in our U.S. Constitution, that's in our Hawaii Constitution. But many states also have, uh, also provide for a preliminary hearing um, as an alternative to that. Who makes the choice? Prosecutor, as far as I know, yeah, 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 it's not yeah. the court. Um, and, and I'm not, I think it's, uh, the preliminary hearings are used just in particular kinds of cases, and I'm not sure how the prosecutor makes those decisions. If you take a preliminary hearing, then effectively you can get you can get past that level of inquiry to a to a what amounts to an indictment and thus a trial. Yeah. Well, um, and with the grand jury, that's a, that is a private uh, a proceeding that occurs in the courthouse. There will be maybe 16 to 23 members of the grand jury. They're so, they're selected separately from regular juries. And they meet maybe once a month or once every two months. Usually there's one assigned to each courtroom. And uh, when the prosecutor has enough evidence that they want to present a case to the grand jury, they call the grand jury into session. It's, it's secret. The defendant is not there. The defendant most likely doesn't even know about it. And, um, and it's all secret. Uh, so there's a the next old, thing he has a knock on well, his door with somebody with it, an indictment. It, yeah, it could be, and there's an old joke, you know, that that uh, a good prosecutor could indict a ham sandwich, you know, because it's one sided. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what. Uh, but uh, but this, but there still has to be evidence, and technically, um, we we give a, jar, a a charge to the grand jury, instructing them what their powers are, and they. There is a judge. <clears throat> You've done that. With the grand jury, I mean, the, I, I don't the, sit in there. The I, grand jury doesn't sit without a judge, does it? Yes, it, it does. does. Yeah, no judge is involved. Right. Well, the way we do it in Hawaii is, um, we assign a, a grand jury counsel to the grand jury, so they have their lawyer. It's mm -hmm. paid by the state, mm -hmm. and so if they have any questions about the law, then they can consult uh, the lawyer, and they can even have them sit there during the proceedings, so he cannot participate except to answer questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, uh, and 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 then after the prosecutor calls whatever witnesses he wants to call, or, or she, and present whatever evidence they wish to present, then the jury, uh, the jury can ask for more evidence. We can say we're not satisfied. You know, we want to hear. You know, other names may come up, and they can request that those people be brought in. Side yeah. point, uh, you, you know, my father was uh, on the jur grand jury in um, oh. in New York for years. New York, oh. yeah, and he loved it, and and uh, he prided himself on the grand juries that he sat on were quote runaway end quote grand juries, right. which meant that they would read the paper and decide that somebody should be indicted, and they would tell the prosecutor to bring evidence, and then they yeah. would, they would tell him what to do. So that was the definition of a runaway grand jury, where they were running, they were running the prosecutor, not the other way around. Yeah. Has that ever happened in Hawaii? Not that I'm aware of, <laughs> but but it but it could. I mean, they they have quite a bit of power. Um, so so the defendant never knows about it, and, and that's good because um, if if there was a grand jury proceeding brought against someone in the community, and the 
and the grand jury failed to find probable cause to believe that a crime had been committed and that the defendant committed the crime, um, then, and, and if it got out that he'd been, been you know, his case been brought before the grand jury, then his reputation might be ruined mm -hmm. for no good reason. Yeah. And so that's another reason to, to keep it secret. So, so you say that in, in uh, Mongolia, they have adopted most recently the preliminary hearing Yes, uh, a, a mechanism. But did they have? Do they have grand juries too? I, I don't know that. I'm I'm in the process of doing the, my research right now. I actually have a cop translated copy of the Constitution. Oh, so no kidding! I'll be able to look, and I can ask uh, uh, Gensberg. And I I, I want to know because I want to be able to compare and contrast for them. To, yeah, to yeah. Admit, I thought that might be helpful for them. But the difference between a preliminary hearing and a grand jury is that. A preliminary hearing is, is an open court proceeding at which the defendant has a right to be present, has a right to be represented by his or her lawyer, and it's a great discovery tool sure. for the defense. And sometimes so it's better it, for the defendant to have the preliminary hearing than the indictment. Well, except that it's public. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so yeah. once you're there and you've you've been everybody knows, right? That's yeah. right, and the press can come in, and and those are public proceedings. So. Uh, I guess you could argue, and it's nice to have uh, uh, the options, I guess, yeah, is, is yeah. a good way to put it. So how do they see us? How do the Mongolians see our system? I mean, you've had contact with them, you've talked with them, you've, you have social experience with them, and you've seen their kids get married <laughs> and all mm -hmm. that, um, and go to law school, and become clerks to judges here. Mm -hmm. um, but I just wonder how they see the U.S., how they see our system. Um, do they want to copy our system? Um, is our system attractive to them in some way? Um, I think it, ha it must have some attraction. I, I can tell you, for instance, Justice Gansori called me up about two years ago and asked me if I could arrange to have our prosecutor in Maui, J.D. Kim, uh, put on a training program for his prosecutors. And he brought a group of 12 prosecutors over, and uh, Prosecutor Kim was kind enough to, um, uh, to uh, he had kind of a canned uh, uh, PowerPoint about the prosecutor's office and what their function was and what they did and how it worked, and he presented that, and they all found it very, very interesting. And you know, it, they're they're so isolated. I mean, they're a completely landlocked country with Russia on one side and China on the other side, and and they're trying to remain independent. Uh, they were not part of the Soviet Union. They were a buffer state, but they were totally dominated by uh, the communist world. And and you know most of the monks were killed, and you know, you know, a lot of terrible things happened. Like it, it goes on in a lot of those. What drives them now? Are they a democracy? Uh, what's what's yeah. the form of government and all that? Yeah, it's a it's a ba basic democracy. Um, I I couldn't describe it in detail, but it's. I think kind of a, a parliamentary democracy, and uh, they have elections and so on. Um, is it an advanced country? I mean, is it is it a comfortable place for travel? Is it uh, is it a well, warm and friendly a place? Uh, well, I think so. Uh, it's beautiful, very beautiful country, um, and um, uh, but there's not much there because it's. Grass, rolling grassland, most of it. And then in the northwest, there are the Altai Mountains, which are these huge mountains mm -hmm. between China and, and Mongolia, across which the, the monks used to go to get to Tibet to do their, you know, on their, on their right pilgrimage. Next to Tibet. Tibet on one side, Russia yeah. on the other side. Yeah. What else is contiguous? Well, China. China. Uh, and I think maybe North Korea has a, wow. has a little, little chip there. They, they, the North Koreans do go there and work. And um, uh, but th their economy is, I, I would say, sluggish because they don't make anything. It's m most of their produce uh, for the country is is agricultural. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. it's sheep and cattle and 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 it's bitter cold in the winter for most of the months, so they can't really grow anything. And uh, there is some tourism. There are apparently great uh, number one. Huge natural resources, copper, gold. They have a gold rush there periodically, <laughs> and uh, and it's like the Wild West. And uh, uh, they they also uh, have uh, 
make uh, interesting finds of dinosaur bones and dinosaur eggs and things like that. Great history. Yeah, it was a very, uh, in, very unique and interesting place. Now, th since they were dominated by the Soviets, their culture isn't like China or Japan. You don't go there and get to feel like you're in an Asian, oh, yeah. country, Asian country. It's, you get, you feel, it feels much more like you're in uh, um, Arme Armenia or Russia or someplace like that. I want, to, uh, I want to explore more of that about life on the ground, life in the courts, life mm -hmm. with the judges uh, after this break. But before we take the break, I, I just want to ask uh, Alexa, What's the population of Mongolia? Oh, it's like about three million, I think. <laughs> and on that note, Any we're going to take a short break. <laughs> this is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Hi, I'm Pete McGinnis Mark, and every Monday at one o'clock. I present Think Tech Hawaii's research in Manoa, where we bring together researchers from across the campus to describe a whole series of scientifically interesting topics of interest both to Hawaii and around the world. So hopefully you can join me one o'clock Monday afternoon for Think Tech Hawaii's research in Manoa. Aloha, my name is Mark Schlav. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. Yes, we're back. We're live. Oh, we're so okay. happy that we found out what the population of Mongolia was <laughs> from Alexa. It's, uh, what is it, 3,080,000, I think she said? Yes. Okay, that's pretty good. And, and, and that's, not right guess, that's not counting the horses and the <laughs> cows and the sheep. We're going to ask her that next. <laughs> that's Judge Shackley Ruffetto, Chief Judge of the Second Circuit, uh, retired, a man who has spent a fair amount of time in Mongolia and who is going there again. And we want to sort of examine his experience and his observations about Mongolia. Uh, I, I could just say, one of the things I'm interested to learn is the way that they're structuring their preliminary hearing. Because, you know, we, we use um, standards of proof. You know, in a criminal case, it's you have to case, prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. In a civil case, it's by a preponderance of the evidence. And in a uh, preliminary hearing, it's, it's uh, a probable cause. All you have to do is provide sufficient evidence so that the decider, whether it's the grand jury or the judge in a preliminary hearing, can make a decision that there's sufficient evidence to say that um, uh, a crime was committed. Uh, it's, it's likely that a crime like, was committed. Likely is the operative word. Yeah, yeah likely. It's, it's, it's much lo lower than, than the other standards, but there, there's, there's no way to, to mathematically quantify these things. That's why we say beyond a reasonable doubt, and mm -hmm. we say um, uh, a preponderance of the evidence. Uh, I always uh, understand a preponderance to mean probably negligent. Yeah. I think that's a good way to put it. Pro people, probably, pe people more can probably than less probably. <laughs> well, that, that gets, <laughs> that gets, that gets it, too it, tough. It gets tongue tied, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> more, more probably so than not so. so. And the jury is looking at you like sophistication? what? They, this is very sophisticated stuff. Our system, you know, in any state <clears> is very sophisticated. Where are they relative to the American way of looking at things? Well, I think, you know, that most of the population, I think, still lives in the countryside, but they're rapidly moving into the main city, which is Ulaanbaatar, which is uh, way overtaxed in terms of its infrastructure. Uh, they live in what they call Ger camps, G-E-R, is the... Um, is the Mongolian word for what we what the Russians call a yurt, yeah. a felt tent yeah. home that they that they can just pick up and move yeah. uh, as part of their nomadic life, and so these camps are really exploding and 
and they have health problems there and so on and but uh, which gets back to you know what do, what do they do there what what can they look forward to they have these extractive industries copper is a, is a really big industry these huge copper mines but uh, I guess Australia is kind of the same they yeah. have a lot of mining and they and they they sell a lot of their their uh, ores to China and I'm sure that that's what happens to a lot of what's mined in uh, um, in Mongolia, but beyond that, I don't know. You know. What about the what about their the punishments there? I mean, so so I, if somebody finds probable cause on me, I go to trial, I get convicted. Am I going to go to jail for life? Am I going to, or am I going to have a very civilized and uh, uh, less draconian result? Well, you'll have a trial, but yeah. uh, but I, I I don't know. I've never seen one, yeah. so I. Oh, that'd be so interesting to see one. Huh? Yes. Uh, you're going to get exposed to that on this trip. When are you going? Maybe um, next month, about the 12th or so. I haven't got my reservations yet, but I'll, I'll be there a week. So it's 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 for a, a conference, a panel, a, a briefing, if you will. It's a it's a law conference, yeah. and they asked me to come and just kind of talk about what we've been talking about, mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully I'll learn more about what their their law actually says. But I want to know how they're going to. Uh, how much evidence is enough? You know, that's a, yeah. always an interesting question because yeah. many countries don't use these concepts of of standard of proof, and uh, and when you start talking to them, they get confused. They don't have the standard. You know, yeah. they can't articulate it. Yeah. Are they? Are they? Um, uh, as a country, as a people, are they literate? Uh, do they read? Uh, are they uh, a nation of laws, uh, the rule of law, as we see it? As far as I can see, yes. Wow, that is yeah. something. They're, they're, um, one concern they do have, though, is because they don't have a, a, a sophisticated infrastructure of, of laws, that they've only been a free country for, you know, not very many years, that uh, they may be victimized by um, organizations that are, 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 will use the resources there for money laundering. And they, I know that the World Bank is it the World Bank? No, the uh, uh, Asia Development Bank yeah. has recently put on a uh, multi-part program to try to uh, train bankers and prosecutors and, and other uh, members of the government there in uh, how to identify money laundering, what to do about it, why it harm it's harmful to the country, and so on. And a friend of mine is was participating in that. That's great, but you know it opens the whole door to something beyond probable cause and beyond criminal justice. Mm -hmm. To call it business justice, mm -hmm. um, you know, business disputes. Uh, and for example, if I happen to be an investor mm -hmm. and I want to invest in, uh, call it an extraction business mm -hmm. or a manufacturing business or who knows what kind of business. Um, what kind of uh, rule of law am I going to find? What kind of mm, legal legal experience am I going to have? Uh, arbitration, mediation, litigation? How does that work? Uh, I I I, can't, I don't know the answer to that question. I think you would want to be very careful, though. Yeah. I mean, it's a it's a young country, and it does not have a long doesn't have a 230 year tradition of operating under a constitution with an elaborate you know set of commercial laws and so on like we have they just don't have that and um, uh, I've, n I've never heard anybody say that the, that the the courts are crooked I've heard them I've heard that said about other countries that I've been to yeah. um, but I haven't heard that said about Mongolia though is there corruption probably some no doubt you know, the thing is that a, a country like Mongolia, as, I, as I've heard it from you, um, it's, it's on a tipping point of some sort. You know, it's, it's, it's got to learn mm -hmm. systems, and including legal systems for, from other places. It, it must move forward or mm -hmm. be left behind in the 21st century. Yeah. It's got to learn how to do trade. It's got to learn to manage investments, uh, offshore investments, foreign investments. And in order to do that, in order to do trade mm -hmm. and manage investments from offshore, it's got to have a legal system that people will have some reliance on. Right. Uh, well, it's a critical thing for them. Well, I've, I've 
worked with a, uh, a couple of other people to try to introduce the Jessup International Law and Moot Court recall. program there. Uh, and w one of the things that has stopped us so far is uh, the lack of uh, uh, language ability in English. Is see, English in, see, in China, the, the kids learn English. Sure. And so you can go teach in English. Right. And, and they're, they're pretty close to fluent. That's not true in Mongolia. Or they speak Mongolian. Yeah. Which is like what, Chinese? No, it's a unique, uh, unique language. language. So the yeah. Constitution They is say spoken. structurally, it's sim again, Zurich says structurally, it's more like Korean. But it doesn't sound like Korean and doesn't look like it when it's written. And then, and they, there was an ancient uh, Mongolian script, which is really quite beautiful and, and unique. And there was some effort to try to move back to that. But during the Soviet period, it, it, um, it was um, uh, changed to, to the use of the, uh, the Russian, uh, the Cyrillic alphabet. Mm -hmm. And so they had to, and in and, and, uh, spoken Mongolian sounds like Eskimo. I mean, it's it's hard to to distinguish the words mm -hmm. when you're listening to it, and so for them to render that in in Cyrillic must have been a heck of a job. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, and I don't think they'll be changing it back because, except for scholars, because it'll just be too difficult. When you go and and when you have gone, mm -hmm. you speak you speak Mongolian. Right? No, no, speak English, and they speak yeah. English. My friends do, yeah. But not yeah. everybody. And younger people tend to, like, like in every country. Um, but you go to the countryside and they don't. Yeah. So it seems to me, um, sort of drawing these points together, is that if they want to improve their legal system, both mm -hmm. criminal and civil, um, they have got to make sure the language is ling lingua franca mm -hmm. uh, for other places, I right. think. Um, to learn, to use, to emulate, whatever it is. To be able to come to America and go, to, go and get training. Right. Without the language skills, that do door is shut. Yeah. 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 And so the first step, it's interesting to put all this together. First step, mm -hmm. if, if I were on their path, I would say, well, we got to speak English. We mm -hmm. got to, we got to, you know, proliferate English teachers. We got to uh, make it ubiquitous in all the schools. And then we can move forward on many things, including law, business, trade, what have you. Yes. So <clears throat> there's, there's, we're, we're, we've, we've talked to, Gensorg and I have talked about, um, they, they are interested in starting a paralegal school. And with that, uh, introducing legal English as a, as a place to start, which is, a, I think, a pretty good idea. That's a great idea. Yeah. Well, when you, when you come back from the trip, uh, can we... Circle back and sure. uh, see what see what happened and see what you learned and how the absolutely was. absolutely I'll I'll know more I'll know more about what they're doing and you know I can explain a little bit I hope and uh, <laughs> we're also Shackley. going to go fishing of course <laughs> part of the program yeah. <laughs> Shackley Ruffetto, retired chief judge of the Second Circuit joining us on the the new due process in uh, Mongolia thank you so much Shackley. thank you Jay good to see you Aloha. <laughs>